tell you tonight's format, because it's going to be a little bit different, given that we have lectures. Uh, Foster is going to speak for half an hour or so, whatever it turns out to be. He'll take questions at that point, then we'll break for coffee. It's decaffeinated coffee. You can stretch your legs, and we'll come back to our seats and uh, be treated to a slideshow. So without any further ado, let me introduce to you Foster Cadell, who has spent his lifetime interested in art. 60 years as a practicing artist. At age 25, he was the youngest member of the Providence Art Club to have a one-man show. By 30, he was a sought-after book illustrator and teacher, eventually becoming owner-teacher of the largest private art school in southern New England. So far, he has authored four educational art books. He's a member of several organizations, including the Pastel Society of America, American Society of Portrait Artists, Connecticut Pastel Society, and undoubtedly his favorite, the LAA. He is listed in the who's who of American art, and most recently was designated a master pastelist by Pastel Society of America, and was inducted into their Hall of Fame in 1998. As we will soon see, Foster Cadell is adept at landscape, portraiture, and still life, but whatever the subject, he paints the drama of light and shadow. He works to enhance the patterns of color and light. It is my pleasure now to introduce to you Foster Cadell. Well, what is it the Bible said, where a few are gathered to together in my name, there I shall be also. Uh, I feel that I speak better with my brush, but uh, here we are, and uh, uh, we'll give it a bloody go, as the English say. Uh, and I'm honored to uh, have this opportunity to speak to the line Art Association, and uh, uh, to actually be here tonight. At 80, you realize that half your life is over. <laughs> and you've earned the right to speak frankly and candidly on the subject you've devoted your whole life to. It's too bad there aren't more people here tonight because I think my words of wisdom would uh, fall on beneficial ears. But I feel the Lyme Art Association is one of the most important art organizations in the country. Uh, being next to the Griswold Museum where, and the site where the American Impressionist movement uh, almost originated in Summit. And uh, the American Impressionist uh, work I admire greatly, uh, you probably see it evidence in my work, I think they accomplished, they were closer to the goal than the French, which swung too far. Uh, there used to be a sign out front, I didn't see it tonight, that the building and I came about in the same time, August 2nd, 1921. And I'm pleased to report that my roof doesn't need repairing. <laughs> But, but the legs could use a bit of help. <laughs> Frankly, I'm a very lucky chap. First to uh, be on, as I said to Bruno tonight, to be on the right side of the sod, be still painting and teaching, and to be here to talk to you tonight. I often reflect that I was very lucky to be classified as an artist with the Air Force in what I refer to as the one we won. Otherwise, I realize I might not uh, have made it and been here, as so many others didn't. I've been lucky to have spent my whole life as an artist, and there aren't many people that can say this. When tragedy struck my life, and I was left alone in the world, and when I say alone, I mean alone, with no children or relatives. I was lucky enough to find another wonderful partner who was with me tonight, and we continued life on again. 
it's most common for artists to do a demonstration at meetings like this, and I feel I should tell you why I'm not. Don't feel slighted, uh, slighted as I turn down the, uh, the same proposal to do one with the Pastel Society of America in New York. I feel the only reason for anyone to watch me do a demonstration is to admire my work and want to see and learn how I go about making a painting. And the only honest way for me to do it is to show them exactly how I do it from the beginning to the end. And incidentally, these three paintings were done as demonstrations. I'm a fairly fast and efficient worker but in one or one and a half hours, which is the extent most audiences are willing to sit, I'm just getting off the ground into a good start. Uh, the work I brought with me tonight, as I just said, were done as demonstrations for my classes, and not many artists to carry a demonstration this far. See, I believe I should show the whole process. Some people are lost and don't know how to start a painting, and others sort of admit that they don't quite know how to finish it up, you know, the last details. This brings up the subject of teaching and workshops as a whole. You should never study with anyone unless you can stand in front of their work and say, I'd give almost anything to be able to do that. To me, classes should be instruction and not reduced to painting factories or adult babysitting. This is catering to today's mentality of instant gratification. Fly now, pay later. Furnish your home, pay for it next week or next year. Painting is a damned hard business and work, and there is no such thing as a free lunch. The first teacher told me that art is a tough mistress. It only gives you back that which you give it. The idea of instant results is an insult to the profession of art instruction. You've seen the ads come and bring a photo of a person or a scene and we'll have you make a painting in a day. This is a case of the instructor lowering themselves to the level of the gullible student instead of setting a lofty goal for the student to hope to achieve to. In general, I refer to this approach as chewing gum for the mind. H.L. Mencken said, nobody ever went broke underestimating the taste of the American public. Most of our TV is the best example of this. I don't have much time to go to exhibitions, but when I do, I'm shocked at the amount of poor work that's being displayed. I've always felt there was nothing wrong in not knowing how to do something, and there are loads of things that I don't know how to do. But not realizing you don't know that you're not able to do it and do something about it is sad. Now, if I think the approach is wrong, what do I feel is right? Art courses and classes should be instructions, not painting production factories. I settled this question years ago when I first started running workshops when my first book came out. And... Uh, that was about 20, 25 years ago. I told them the first night when we gathered together that they came on looking for a painting to make an appointment and come to the studio some night and buy one. And this happened quite often. I did not eat, pretend to send them home with a finished painting, but I intended to send them home with a lot more knowledge. When you get it in here, you'll make the painting. On my last trip to England, I stood over the plaque of the author, Henry James, who was buried in Westminster Abbey. 
and remember what he said. I live in such a way that makes shaving in the morning remain a pleasant experience. He had to look at himself. No teachers I study with would ever think of having students copy photos, and I never had. I had to work from, ah, I need a look. I had to work from photos when I was an illustrator from a practical point because I had to, with all the subject matter was not available. I had to use photos for reference. But I already knew how to paint and I knew when photos lied. In my classes indoors, we mostly paint from still lifes, which incidentally is the basis of all painting. The training of drawing well, seeing value relationships, mixing colors accurately, this is what I find is lacking in students as I go around the country. People want to go out and make pretty pictures, but they don't want to train. They, they don't want to, what I refer to as paying the price of learning how. And also, I, I refer to uh, still life as what we, we work in the course of a year, I try to give the student an approach to everything because I believe, in fact, I just wrote an article for the Pastel International Magazine in which I said an artist, a good artist, like a good musician, a good musician can play anything, a good artist can paint anything. And that's why I brought an example of the three types of uh, uh, subject matter that we're going to talk about. Now, regarding a class, if the student could do it well, they wouldn't be there. So as they try to do it, they show me what knowledge they're lacking and where they need help. It's a simple process. As I say, I compare art to music. It's like music teachers putting up a sheet of music and saying, play this for me. As they attempt to play it, they display their weaknesses. So many want to be artists say they don't like all those bottles and books. That's why we have the copying photo classes. But still life is the basic training for all other matter. In fact, it's the simplest form of painting. The conditions don't change. A still life doesn't have to get up and take a break and go to the bathroom. The lighting never changes. The sky never changes. You've removed every weakness except the weakness of the student. I believe I was the only author to close each of my books stating the importance of still life painting. The reason I did not do a book on still life because they failed to keep my last book in print. And I just cannot spend a year working, putting a book, because I wrote my own books, putting a book together and not have them keeping it in print. The most important element in teaching art is perspicacity, or seeing and understanding what you see, and breaking it down to line, value, and color. No matter what the problem is, there's only three elements to a painting. Painting is putting the right value and color in the right place. But it takes years to, to learn how to do this. Like, art is like medicine. Sometimes uh, if there's a doctor in the audience, they don't like this, but I refer, many times I refer to medicine. They claim a chimpanzee could treat if he could diagnose. Figuring out what should be done before you do it, that's the most difficult thing. Every stroke on a painting either helps it or hurts it and has to be accurately determined before the brush touches the canvas. Something one must realize is that when you hang a painting in public, you're showing the whole world 
how much you know, but also how much you don't know. The saving grace is most of the public cannot read a painting. When I was 30, I decided I was on what Fred Allen used to refer to as the treadmill to oblivion. I was a frustrated Sunday painter working all week in a lithograph company and figured at 65 I'd be handed the gold watch like all the other uh, retired uh, artists. So I decided to combine my knowledge of printing and publishing with my desire to paint and become an illustrator. Facing reality, I went back, I went back and studied myself because even though I could paint quite well, I knew I wasn't good enough and I practiced what I preach. Many aesthetics look down on illustrators but most of those who criticize illustrators are not good enough to be one. I found the best way to get rid of artistic temperament was to have a nice big mortgage. I did, and I did not want to starve in a garret. Students place too much emphasis on being inspired, put that in quotes. Naturally, I find some subjects more interesting than others. But as an illustrator, I found the more subject matter I could deal with, the more jobs and consequently the more money I made. The term freelance artist comes from the old soldier of fortune who sold his lands to various kings and dukes even if he didn't necessarily believe in the cause that he was fighting for. And I'll give you an example uh, of myself. I never played or was interested to this day in watching sports. I think it's civilization's way of waging war. I never had children. And I don't go to church on Sunday. What did I become famous for? Sports books, children's books, and paintings for many of the world's great religions, such as the Church of England, the Southern Baptist, and the Mormons. I alluded to the fact that I was a, an artist in the Air Force, and I'm, awful, I'm thankful that I don't have a grandson who climbs up on my knee and asks, how did you help win the war, Graham? How could I tell him that one of the things I did was make VD posters? <laughs> Prophylaxis beats the axis. <laughs> After a year in New York, I found myself in the jungles of New Guinea. The next year and a half, I found myself sketching, traveling around, and meeting people, the natives, the natives of New Guinea it was a, one of the most primitive civilizations in the world. The first wheel that some of them saw was on an airplane. And I went on in that year and a half to seeing firsthand the beginning of the atomic era as I flew over Hiroshima right after we dropped the bomb. Because we had to travel light, I could only take watercolors and paper overseas. It took me, me six months to try and master this new medium. That's why I have the great respect for someone who can handle it well. It's not too often artists compliment each other. And I have down here like Lou Bonamart, but he's not here to hear my accolades. It's a performance, doing a watercolor it requires great skill. Because it's difficult to correct, I feel it's a bad medium for students to try to learn in. Yet eight out of 10 of the best-selling books on instructional art are on watercolor. 
Students seem to think it's easy and one doesn't have to lug a lot of equipment and supplies. The subject matter of my work in the Pacific taught me a good lesson. I could have sold everything I made to the service people over there but I saved it and it became the nucleus of my first one-man show at the Providence Art Club and incidentally I was the youngest member to have a one-man show there. But I learned people do not buy art, they buy subject matter and South Pacific did not sell. Uh, I'm lucky I still have about 300 paintings and sketches and they are going to find a good home, though, because the War Museum at Brown University has asked that they be donated to them as part of their permanent archives. I'd like to touch briefly on teaching again. Actually, I never had any idea of teaching when I decided to start out on my own. It started with four people in the village who asked me to have an evening sketch class. It gradually grew each year until I had nine classes a week and 140 students. It was the largest private teaching program in New England. And a bit of my philosophy is your good points are your, also your bad points. I decided early on there was only two ways of becoming success, uh, successful. Either you had to be crooked or work like a bastard. So I decided to take the honest way and I worked 80 and 90 hours a week. When you're an illustrator, you meet deadlines. Word of my instruction spread. I was written up by the editor, Norman Kent, in the December issue of The American Artist back in 1968. This resulted in being asked to put my teaching into book form. And at last count, there are some 350,000 books all over the world and in foreign languages. You don't get rich writing a technical book. When you, people say, oh, you've written a book, they think of these people that receive these huge advances. They write these sexy novels that are turned into movies, but the only thing you do, you get the satisfaction of having your work uh, go all over the world, and you do reach and help a lot of people who are isolated and don't have teachers. In fact, if I could touch on one item that I didn't have down here, the book on portraiture, uh, the cover of that I, I was in the first time I was in London, I went into the National uh, Portrait Gallery and was surprised because they were selling my portrait book there. These are the pleasures and thrills you get out of uh, uh, doing something like this. I'm particularly proud of helping so many women. I'm glad to see so many women in the audience. Historically, I'm on your side, gals, women have had a tough time because the men made all the rules and the laws, that it should have been just as many women artists as men, but you were busy raising families and keeping house. Remember what uh, uh, in The King and I, Yul Brenner said, the bee can go from flower to flower, but the flower cannot go from bee to bee. Uh, I'm proud of my lineage of the great teachers who have helped me, and also pleased that I've been able to pass on the help to so many. And here again, Joan Ballinger, who I don't see here tonight, is one of my local examples of passing it on. Uh, it is a bit disconcerting when you set, help someone get started and later here they proclaim that they're self-taught. Very few artists are self-taught. I've always been interested in portrait painting. In fact, so in some circles, that's where I'm known best. It has enabled me to meet and enjoy the friendship of so many people. 
I might not otherwise have met. Of local interest was doing the portrait of Tom Dodd when he was senator. In fact, he lived in a little cottage down the line here. And recently, we visited Washington, and I had the pleasure of seeing again his son, Chris. We had a photo session in front of his father's portrait that hangs in his office down there. So often, students come to me to see if I could teach them how to do a portrait. Portraiture is the heart surgery of painting. If you can do a damn good still life, there's hope of doing a portrait and not before. Le on the subject of portrait painting, let me tell you an interesting story. I recently met a friend who had posed for a class nearby, and people always like to talk intelligently and sophisticatedly, so she said it was so interesting how each student saw her so differently. So I enjoy being the iconoclast, and I told her, they don't see you differently unless there's something wrong with their eyes. In today's vernacular, they just screw up in different ways <laughs> because they couldn't draw and paint accurately. And their mistakes create various versions. You're too fat, too sad, too pale, or what have you. Now, some of you may not agree with all the things I've said here tonight, but I do think we all agree on a sane approach to art. Modern art would not be as popular if the layperson had had been more vocal and said, who the hell are you kidding? Or the emperor has no clothes. This is a subject that we could discuss at length, but uh, I must say part of the problem is that the art world is uh, dominated by what I call artistic eunuchs. They can talk about it, but they can't do it. Their cause was helped by magazines like Time, who enjoyed showing the outlandish and spectacular. Let me tell you of one incident where the artist spread his canvas on the studio floor, applied paint to the nude models, and they got down and squirmed around all over the cameras, creating uh, abstract designs. I enjoyed the letter that one reader wrote in saying, he didn't think much of the artwork, but he'd sure like to find some of his used brushes. <laughs> What I'd like to read to you, I'm fortunate that one of my mentors gave me, most of you probably are not old enough to realize it was a sophisticated magazine called the American Mercury, about the size of the Reader's Digest years ago. It has long gone out of print. And I have the copy of August 1957, and I'd like to read something to you and then I'll tell you who wrote it. From the moment that art ceases to be the food that feeds the best minds, the artist can use his talents to perform all the tricks of the intellectual charlatan. Most people can today no longer expect to receive consolation and exultation from art. The refined, the rich, the professional do-nothings, the distillers of quintessence, desire only the peculiar, the sensational, the eccentric, the scandalous in today's art. And I myself, since the advent of Cubism, have fed these fellows what they wanted and satisfied these critics with all the ridiculous ideas that have passed through my head. The less they understood them, the more they admired me. 
though amusing myself with all these observed, through amusing myself with all these observed bosses, I became celebrated and very rapidly. For a painter, celebrity means sales and consequence affluence. Today, as you know, I am celebrated and I am rich. But when I am alone, I do not have the effrontery to consider myself an artist at all. Not in the grand old meaning of the word. Giotto, Titian, Rembrandt, Goya were great painters. I am only a public clown, a mountbank. I have understood my time and have exploited the imbecility, the vanity, the greed of my contemporaries. It is a bitter confession, this confession of mine, more painful than it may seem, but at least and at last it does have the merit of being honest. Picasso wrote that. And I think it's the only time in his life he looked in the mirror and told the truth. I ran workshops in Connecticut, and people come on there. When I finally agreed to travel and teach, I made a slide presentation, and that's what I'm going to show you tonight. I've had the forethought to take progressive slides of all my work so that in this way you'll see how many of my paintings were made and brought to a conclusion, not a hasty slapdash quickie. So we'll take a break and I'll show you the slide. I would uh, entertain any questions. Uh, we all, well. Yes. I, I am painting once again. So, yeah. Would you, would you recommend someone taking a drawing class first and not even touch? Yes and no. Yes and no. Years ago, when you had a long curriculum, you spent a year drawing and working yourself up. And so the idea is not bad but I find the average student is not that patient. So you let them tackle something that is above them and quite, uh, uh, you admit to them that they're not gonna be able to do it, but you try to teach them drawings to see color. And I tell my average student, it's gonna take you a year to even begin to think as an artist and know what I'm talking about. So. You're right in theory, but I try to do it all at once. And, and it, because you have to, drawing is like spelling and grammar. It has to come automatically because there were, you want to write a wonderful novel. You can't stop and think. It would be like music, making a painting is like composing a great piece of music. You can't stop and think, how do I form this chord here? So it has to be, come automatically, but I try to teach it uh, as we go along. And I try to be level with, uh, with students. I remember years back I had a portrait class and I usually have a still life set up on one side because some of the people just, portrait is uh, heart surgery. And so I happened to say that I had a doctor and uh, uh, sometimes I think the secret of my success is I was cheaper than the shrink. And, uh, but uh, I had many people in the medical profession study with me. But he pestered the daylights out of me. I wanted to put him on the still life because that was the category he should have been in. But he kept pushing me, wanted to go over and tackle the portrait. And I said, fine, okay, if we both know now I'm letting you into the operating room, the patient's going to die. Because you cannot do it till you get it in here. Yeah. So it has to be learned, but whether people are patient enough to spend a year drawing. I am fortunate I always like to draw, and I've always drawn all my life. Is there any other? Yes, dear. Do you think everybody can learn to do this? Let us say this. I, it's been amazing 
because uh, I'd say 50% of the population could be taught to play the piano if they wanted to badly enough and were willing to work at it. So I have had people from all levels, and it's amazing what people can be taught. See, the, there are three things necessary for being an artist. If I have to, I throw this a bit dry here then. One is to be, a, to be a good, successful artist, and I think this is true of other professions. Uh, God has to be kind to you. You have to be born with a lot of talent. The amount of talent, like fertile field, you have to have a lot of, but it's amazing what you can do without a lot of natural talent. Then you have to be willing to work, because it is work. And then the third ingredient is that you have to be born into a society where you can see good art and there are good teachers. If having the first two I was born into a tribe in Africa, I merely would have carved a little better totem pole. Uh, so. Do you teach now in Somalia? I teach in the town of Ballantown, the only town by that name in the whole United States. It is my escape from the madding crowd, and I do teach one day a week and morning and afternoon. And if you're willing to work, you're welcome. Yeah. Mondays. Mondays, yeah, Mondays. Yeah. But it's amazing what can be taught. We have to, what's there? Where is that? Way over on the Rhode Island line. It's right on, on the Rhode Island line. In fact, the name of a bit of history for you in the King Philip War, the Indian Wars in Rhode Island, a group of volunteers from the area in eastern Connecticut volunteered to go over and help put the Indians down and in their place. And in lieu of wages, they were given land grants. And it was originally named Volunteer Town. And, uh, and part, the good thing about it is not the navel of civilization, but it is two thirds of it is state forest. And that's the good thing. In fact, I have 20 acres, and the rear of me is state forest. It sounds very remote, but really, it's only about a 35 or 20 acre It's not. It's, it's pretty direct. Up 395, um, and, and then a straight shot up 395. So it sounds like you have to go, you know, to the middle. Well, we'll take a break. Is that your idea? And. Uh, then we'll, I'll show you some slides of my work.